Well, I want to thank the organizers. It's been an um, enjoyable uh, conference so far. Hopefully, I don't ruin it. <laughs> but I'm looking forward to other people's talks as well. So um, what I'm going to talk about is something that I'm uh, very passionate about, which is trying to understand how um, we can make use of the various kinds of high-throughput data that um, are increasingly available, unlike my pointer, which is no longer available. Um, oh, here it is. No? All right, well, I'll point a lot. Um, uh, various kinds of high throughput data to understand um, uh, and have an impact on human health. And so just to clarify some of the, the jargon, right? So obviously um, after the high throughput uh, sequencing of the genome, uh, biologists realized that they could use the same technology to interrogate many other kinds of molecules. So in, after the genome, we have the transcriptome, all the mRNAs that, uh, and other uh, RNAs that are expressed in the cell. And then uh, the epigenome, which is measurements of protein DNA interactions and which regulatory regions are functional under uh, which conditions. Um, but that's led to a motivation to maybe we can measure everything in the cell, and we're not quite there yet, uh, but we're definitely on our way. So the proteome is the measurements of all the proteins. Yeah, I, I must have lost it or something. Uh, they had it here. Oh, on the floor. All right, thank you. There we go. Right. So the, the proteome is the measure of all the proteins um, using uh, mass spec, which is a different technology, but the motivation is the same. Can we have a comprehensive catalog of all the molecules in the cell and how they change in response to different perturbations? I'll be talking today quite a bit about the metabolome, which is small molecules, and that's used generically to cover metabolites, lipids, many other kinds of molecules as well. I don't think this one got an ohm. But uh, screening data, right, uh, so screenome perhaps, um, but all the genetic perturbations that one can do to cell, whether it's CRISPR, RNAi, um, siRNAs, um, or uh, traditional knockouts uh, in yeast, um, to look at uh, chemical perturbations as well to see how the phenotype is affected. And then the interactome is the set of all protein-protein interactions. And so the question is whether all these data have really helped us uh, understand and treat disease. And so what I think they've done so far is help us understand basic biology. The amount that we've learned about transcription in the last decade is probably more than everything since Manon and Jacob combined. Uh, so it's really been amazing. Um, the microbiome was not uh, something people really thought about much, but all the microbes that are inhabiting us and contributing positively or negatively to our health. Uh, proteomics has told us a lot about signaling that we didn't know about before. When you think about moving closer and closer to human health, I think the big impact has been on tumor classification, telling us the subtypes of tumors with fine detail hasn't really led to any uh, new therapies, and I'm willing to be challenged on that, but I'm not aware of any therapy that we could really say you got with omics that you could not have gotten in other ways. There are certain places where omics agrees with what a histologist would tell you, uh, but beyond that. So, um, so what I'm interested in is whether we can go beyond just collecting these data and understanding the basic biology, which is important in and of itself, and move on to actually finding points of intervention in the cell to develop new therapeutics. And so the outline of today's talk will be, uh, first I'd like to give an extremely uh, quick motivation of what we're doing and the methods. I spoke here in August at the beginning of, uh, of this uh, series of workshops, and so I want to go through this quickly enough so those of you who are here don't start reading your email, um, but slowly enough for those of you who are not can actually follow what's going on. So hopefully I hit the right balance. If I don't look confused and I'll, or look bored, and I'll try to speed up or slow down as appropriate. Um, and then I'd like to show you how uh, we've been advancing these methods now to focus on metabolomics and the potential that metabolomics have for understanding a wide range of diseases which were not necessarily thought of as being metabolic in nature. All right, so this uh, was probably the first 15 minutes of the last talk. Hopefully I can do it uh, a lot uh, more quickly. So we apply these omics technologies to our biological system of interest. And now what are you going to do with those data? So the typical thing uh, one does is one goes back to gene ontology, which we talked about yesterday, or other hand annotated or maybe automatic, like the um, uh, stuff Trey was talking about, uh, pathway annotations, and try to see to what extent do the data that I've found in this condition relate to some known pathway. And that has value, but as I uh, showed in that previous talk, it actually captures a fairly very small fraction of all the biological change. So in systems where we know what's going on, allegedly, and we carry out a perturbation and we match it up with the databases, about 15% of uh, the signal is actually in the annotated pathway. Now, the other stuff is actually happening, and it's relevant to that pathway, but someone has to draw a circle around where the pathway ends, right? <laughs> 
and that's very important for categorization, um, but it doesn't mean that the stuff that's outside of that circle as the signal continues to propagate is irrelevant to that biological process. So we need ways of capturing all of that and understanding it in the context of our diseases. So that's one of the first challenges. We can't just plug our data into annotated pathways. A, a second kind of approach is when you do more than one kind of experiment on the same biological system. And Esty, who uh, was my postdoc at the time, and he's here today, and uh, Lau Riva, who was also posting live in time, really did a deep dive into this using yeast data. And what they showed was that when you apply more than one of these omic technologies to the same system, you get typically less overlap than you would expect by chance among the results. Right? And so what does that mean? So the, the nervous approach would be, oh my gosh, our assays are terrible, and that's why there's no overlap. But in fact, what uh, she showed quite elegantly is that these different assays are assaying different questions, they're answering different questions. And so if you take everything as answering the same question, you don't see much overlap, you feel upset. But actually, if you realize that there are different kinds of information that you get out of different omics, then you can try to design an approach that actually captures those differences. So um, when people talk about data integration in omics, they often mean doing one of these Venn diagrams and taking the overlap. But in fact, that's exactly the wrong approach, because all the stuff you're leaving out is what's really interesting. OK, and, and the last point uh, I want to make on this uh, challenge is, is what do you do with all the mRNA data that are out there? So I haven't checked the databases recently, but a few years ago, they were approaching about a million uh, gene expression data sets in the various G, uh, G, um, Go, sorry, GEO database and the uh, European one. So we've got a lot of mRNA data. And the intuitive thing that everyone in the field felt was the right thing to do was to use this as a proxy for protein levels. That made sense until we could actually measure protein levels in a high throughput way. And then we discovered that actually the two are very poorly correlated. So what are we going to do with all that mRNA data if it's a bad proxy for protein levels? So those are the motivations for our approach. Um, so the approach that we take is imagine you've got some biological process and you're reading it out with these different assays. Um, and I've colored molecules based on what assay is detecting them. And there'll be biological processes that are not annotated correctly in the databases that consist of some molecules detected by one assay and some molecules detected by another and a lot of molecules that weren't detected by any assay. So you want to recapture all of these biological processes de novo without having recourse to the databases and without needing any single assay to give us all the right answers. And if we do this well, then we can capture a lot of molecules that were invisible to the different assays. So that's the motivation. So how do we go about doing this? So with the mRNA data, we said we can't use them as a proxy for protein levels. So what are they a good proxy for? Well, they are a pretty good proxy for transcription. They're not perfect because we're not measuring de degradation rates and so on. But we can use the mRNA data as evidence that some transcriptional regulator turned on or off those genes. And so we're going to use epigenomic data and sequence analysis to try to identify those DNA binding proteins. And then we're going to try to find what were the signaling pathways that activated those transcription factors. And so we can do that by incorporating different kinds of data. Say it's data about which proteins are phosphorylated from a mass spec experiment or from a high throughput screen, which ones are drug targets that affect the cells in that particular condition. So we've got these other molecules that may be in the same pathway, and we want to try to figure out how they're connected. And here we turn to the interactome, that giant compendium of all physical, in this case, protein-protein interactions, and we try to find the connections. So that's the general motivation. Now, when we actually do this, uh, and you might have some sense of this from yesterday's talks, because of the small world properties of the network, it's very easy to connect almost anything to almost anything else. And so very rapidly, you've turned a problem, a small problem that you don't understand, into a large problem that you don't understand. Right? And you get one of these hairballs. And so we need to figure out how to get rid of the hairball. And so there are many different approaches. And the one that we're quite fond of is this thing called a prize-collecting Steiner Forest approach. And this I'll just try to, again, explain very quickly because I went through in great detail the last time I was here. The idea is that um, we have some molecules in our interactome. This is a tiny piece of that hairball, which we've experimentally detected as changing, maybe through phosphoproteomics. Those have, say, the, the yellow color. We've got these transcription factors that are triangles that we detected by analyzing the mRNA data and trying to go upstream. And then there are a lot of molecules that we don't know anything about in gray. And all these interact interactions, uh, which are the lines. And we're trying to ask the algorithm to find some subnetwork here that is highly implicated as being relevant to the disease. So in addition to knowing how much uh, information we have about uh, each node, whether it's changing or not, we also know a lot about the edges, because these databases of interactions allow us to go back and understand the reliability of the edges. So we can weight each edge by its reliability. 
And so we assign an edge cost based on the reliability of an edge. If you're unreliable, you cost a lot. If you're reliable, you're cheap. And we assign a prize to each node based on our confidence that it's changing the biological system. And then we try to optimize this equation, which says try to leave behind as few prizes as possible, gather as many prizes as you can into the network. But every time you add a prize, when you add the edge, you have to pay a cost for that edge. And that trade-off then, um, which is determined by this one parameter, allows you to determine the size of the final network. And so when the algorithm is trying to decide whether to include this node, it'll get the prize if it includes it, but I'll have to pay all these edge costs. Uh, at the same time. So that's the trade-off. And by optimizing this problem, uh, then you can get smaller or larger networks that you believe are uh, more relevant to your disease. So in the interest of time, I'm not going to go through how you solve this, but I'm happy to talk to people in the discussion afterwards about how to do that. Um, so that was the very, very fast overview of the method. Now I'm going to tell you about how uh, we think about this incorporating new kinds of data and metabolomics in particular. So uh, this is work done by two graduate students in my lab, Anthony Soltis and Leila Pirhaji. Uh, Anthony is working primarily on targeted metabolomics and Leila on untargeted. So what's the difference here? So a lot of assays, you can measure a couple of hundred metabolites. And you know when you do the assay that measuring, say, ATP or measuring a particular phospholipid. That's what I'm going to talk about first. But untargeted metabolomics is much, much broader than that. You can measure tens of thousands of things. But typically, all you find out is the mass of those molecules. You don't know exactly what they are. So we need slightly different approaches for those two different kinds of data. OK, so we've got these metabolites. We'll first talk about ones where we know the identity. We know that a particular sphingolipid is changing in our assay, or a particular uh, ATP is uh, changing in our assay. And how are we going to incorporate this in, um, into this approach? So hopefully, uh, the approach, uh, the idea is fairly simple. We just need to be able to find edges that represent the physical associations of those metabolites with proteins. And so for that purpose, we took a protein-protein interaction uh, database and added to it protein-small molecule interactions. So our final combined network has over a million edges. It's got over 40,000 nodes. And it represents a fairly good fraction of what's known today about all different kinds of molecular interactions inside cells. Again, uh, in the interest of time, I'm not going to go through the details of this. There are a lot of subtleties as to how you weight this. Maybe we didn't do this the best possible way. Uh, it would be good in the discussion to hear uh, people's comments. But uh, we chose a particular way of weighting these various kinds of databases. But then importantly, we test our results to see how sensitive they are to those choices. So we only report results that are robust to various choices that we make and how to combine these interactomes. The point I'd like to linger on a little bit more, and this again was motivated by stuff that uh, we talked about yesterday, was up to do with high degree nodes in these interactomes. So these are histograms showing uh, the number of nodes with a particular degree. And notice the log scales. So in the protein-protein interactome, there are a few uh, proteins that have a degree distribution of over 100. But in the protein metabolite interactome, it actually is quite worse. There are some nodes that have a degree of over 10,000. So if I've got these nodes in my network that are connected to 10,000 things, think of, say, calcium or something like that. right? And in the protein interactome, maybe think about P53, molecules that are either highly studied or really are ubiquitously interacting with many things. They will allow me to connect almost anything I measure to almost anything else. So what am I going to do about that? If I put those into my network, then they're going to show up in every single network I generate, and they're going to trivially basically short circuit my network. On the other hand, if I leave them out, right, I'm throwing away real biology. I want P53 to show up in my cancer data. I just don't want it to show up in every single data set. So the approach that uh, we took to this was to go back to the idea that we have these prizes that we can associate with nodes for which we think we have evidence that they are part of our biological system. Oh, just one second, I'll come to you in a second. Um, and we can also then put a prize in the negative sense. We can give a negative prize in the case we don't believe something is relevant to our biological system. And by having both positive prizes, this data was changing my system, and negative prize, don't include this high degree node unless you're certain about it. Right? Then it allows the algorithm to trade it off. And so the negative prize that we give is based on the degree of a node. It's negative times some constant times the degree if it's a protein times the degree squared if it's a metabolite. Yes, you had a question. I was going to ask you where the prize numbers came from. Like, okay. Yes, there's okay. a formula for it. Yeah, there's a formula for it. <laughs> now, there is, again, a new parameter that we have to introduce, and this has to be chosen um, arbitrarily at some level. I mean, we try to uh, use various kinds of validation, but we assign this based on the degree distribution. Can you just vary the numbers to see how the analysis 
so. Exactly. We vary the numbers to see how stable our results are to various parameter choices. So um, there'll be regimes in which you tend to get um, fairly similar results over a broad range of parameters. Those are the networks that we want to focus on. So this approach then allows the algorithm to, to include P53 or calcium when it's really relevant, but not be forced to include it just as the shortest path between everything to avoid it short-circuiting our network. So I think this is an important uh, aspect and advantage of using uh, this formulation, although there are obviously other ways you could approach this as well. All right, so to give you an example of how this works, I'll show you uh, the work that Anthony's been doing on insulin resistance. This is obviously a major problem in the developed world, but it's increasingly a problem in the developing world. Uh, insulin resistance is one of the first steps towards type 2 diabetes, which is typically caused by overeating. And so we have a mouse model of this where we put mice on uh, one of two diets that can eat uh, as much as they want of either the normal chow that mice in laboratories get or a high-fat diet. If you put them on the high-fat diet, they get, as you might imagine, fat. Um, and when they get fat, they get insulin resistant. Interestingly, not all mice uh, strains have the same uh, outcome. Um, but anyway, the, the standard laboratory mouse uh, gets fat on these high-fat diets and becomes insulin resistant. And so working together with Roger Davis at UMass Medical and Jared Marto at Harvard Medical School, we collected many different kinds of omic data on the livers of these mice after they had gotten fat and insulin resistant. So in my lab, we collected RNA-seq data. Uh, we also did CHIP-seq for various protein DNA interactions. Jared did protein analysis by mass spec, and we used metabolon uh, to give us targeted metabolomic data. Okay, so what do you see when you look at these data? So these data have all the challenges that we expected when we analyzed these problems. So here I'm showing you um, mRNA data and protein level data for each gene. So for each gene is a row, and then it shows you the encoded mRNA and the encoded protein. And it's colored red if it's uh, increased in the high-fat diet and blue if it's decreased in the high-fat diet. And you can see that there's no correlation between the two. You can make the signal a little bit better if you focus, if you remove all the white uh, rows, basically, and focus on those things that are changing in both uh, the mRNA level and the protein level. But again, your correlation comes out to about 0.4, which is what typically people see. To get better than this, you really need to do experiments in systems where you can measure degradation rates and synthesis rates, and that's not applicable at all here. So it's not surprising, but it also means there's no point in trying to use the mRNA as proxies for proteins, as we described before. So instead, remember, what we're going to do with the mRNA data is we're going to use it as a proxy for transcriptional changes. We're going to try to identify de novo what the transcription factors were. And here we take advantage of the fact that we measured, using CHIP-seq, various histone marks. So if these vertical lines indicate places where there are big changes in the histone data, we suspect that there's some set of transcription factors that are sitting there. So we look for these regions near the changes in the histone data, and we scan them for the motifs. We have a large library of motifs, so we get a bunch of motifs. Now, not all these motifs are going to be right. So we use a simple uh, univariate regression approach to try to figure out um, which transcription factors uh, have the biggest impact on gene expression. So transcription factor motif has to be present in these regions near the chromatin changes, and its uh, strength of the motif has to increase uh, as genes have a stronger motif, they have to have a bigger effect on transcription, whether that's in this case going up with transcription uh, or going down. Okay. And again, I'd be happy to talk with people about the details afterwards. So we recapture a, a number of known transcription factors, but a, a lot of unknowns as well. And then we can put those into this uh, prize clicking Steiner Forest approach. I renamed prize clicking Steiner Forest, which I can barely pronounce, into Omics Integrator. Hopefully, it's also a little easier to remember. So we plug all these different data that we collected and our collaborators collected into Omics Integrator. What do we get out? We get out a network, and we can then cluster that network and see whether there are functionally coherent modules, whether we discover new proteins that are associated with insulin resistance uh, with diabetes. So one of the challenges in interpreting these networks, so you get hundreds of nodes, some of them were implicated directly in your data. You measure the protein was changing. But in this case, about uh, 465 of these proteins were not previously detected, were not directly detected in our experiments. So there, um, these hidden nodes, or in the prize clicking steiner forest approach, they're sometimes called Steiner nodes. So all the things in white are these um, nodes that for which, oh, sorry, sorry. So, uh, so we have these hidden nodes. We want to try to figure out if they've been previously associated with the disease. So we used a, a database called DisGeneNet which uh, uses natural language processing and also some uh, curation to try to associate genes with the disease to try to systematically figure out how many of these things uh, in our network are actually previously associated with either diabetes, insulin resistance, um, or obesity. 
And we can see that a fairly large fraction of all the proteins that we're identifying had not previously been associated with the disease. Now, we're not going to try to go through systematically and try to study um, 500 novel proteins. So instead, we try to look at these functionally coherent subunits, subnetworks, and try to, well, look at these subnetworks and try to see if they're functionally coherent and see if we can learn something about insulin resistance. Yeah? Did you measure the significance of this? Like maybe the database has, you know, millions of associations no. and therefore it's insignificant. We didn't look for the significance. This was primarily a tool for us to try to decide what to focus on further. So it may or may not be significant. But when you're looking at these networks, you don't want to spend all your time studying something that's already well characterized in the disease. And I'm not such an expert on insulin resistance to be able to say, ah, yes, you know, XL23, that's well characterized. But you could simply see whether. whether yeah, we could. We, take, you know, yeah, I should, we should do it. We should do the hypergeometric distribution. I just don't know the answer. Yeah. Question? Yeah. So, in generating this uh, uh, Steiner forest, uh, is there a difference in the semantics except the weights between the uh, proteins and the small molecules? Because I'm thinking about a situation where you have a chain. Previously, you had a chain of protein that you could interpret as a signaling pathway. Right. Now you could have protein, uh, metabolite, protein, metabolite, and it's not clear what the semantic would be. That's right. So the semantics here is entirely just that an edge represents a physical association. So when we have multiple uh, substrates of an enzyme, they'll all be connected by edges to that enzyme, right? And then depending on how the network structure comes out, it might not be easily easy to reconstruct what that was in terms of metabol metabolic process. I'll show you an example of that, actually. So here's a, a, a sub-network where, again, the things that have color, red or blue, are things that are changing in high-fat diet or uh, not in the normal diet. Um, these diamond shapes are metabolites. Um, the circles are proteins, gray things were then uh, nodes that were added by the algorithm. And it's not obvious that there's an enzymatic pathway here. So one has to then do some work to try to figure out what's going on. Now, in this particular case, many, many of the molecules here are involved in bile acid metabolism. So we had some reason to think that something was going on with bile acid metabolism. Uh, but it turns out that two of these are actually transporters for bile acid. And so this led us to a hypothesis that it wasn't necessarily could be, but it wasn't necessarily a problem with the metabolism of bile acid. It might be a problem with the transport of bile acid. And so I actually went back to these livers and actually able to show that there's a lot of leakage of bile acid into uh, the liver. So again, the semantics is purely interactions, and in the interpretation then requires other kinds of approaches. And I'll come back to that point at the very end. Um, so we did a number of other kinds of, of tests here, hypotheses that emerged from uh, the networks that we were then able to test by going back to the histology of these uh, liver samples. We could detect changes in the hepatic architecture and changes in apoptosis and so on. Okay. Five minutes. All right, so I'll, I will probably cut through a bunch of slides here. Um, but I also want to mention, so that previous work was all in cases where we knew what the metabolite was that was changing, and so we could put a node in the network. But in, um, most uh, of the metabolites are not detectable by that assay. So rather, they're detectable by mass spec experiments where you get a mass, but you don't know what it is. And so we needed a way to be able to incorporate these untargeted metabolites. Now, the traditional way of doing it is to actually do very time-consuming and expensive steps to take some molecule that you've detected as a mass and try to figure out exactly what it is. So um, I'm impatient. <laughs> So how are we going to handle the unknown metabolites? Well, the idea is actually pretty simple. We'll add a node to the network that represents not the metabolite itself, but the mass that we detected in the mass spec. And we'll draw edges between that mass node and the possible uh, metabolites that could be within the error range of our instrument. And now, when we, after we solve, solve the process collecting Steiner force approach, some of those nodes are going to be rather unconnected. Some of them are going to be connected. So that allows us to throw out some possibilities. And then we do these robustness calculations to see how often we get nodes back. And that allows us to give increased confidence to some uh, assignments as opposed to others. And just to give you an example, she applied this Huntington's disease uh, where she had 38 untargeted metabolite peaks for lipids, which could be associated with up to 300, well, slightly more than 300 metabolites. Um, and we also had uh, 31 phosphotyrosine changes. And when you collect, do the prize collecting Steiner force approach in each of these data types separately, you get almost no overlap. 
but when you uh, combine them together, you recapture almost everything that you would have captured with the data set separately and a lot more. So here's an example of this where these are the mass nodes. These are potential assignments. The size indicates our confidence in the assignment. And we went back with a different platform where we could actually measure these specific lipids. Um, and we were able to confirm that these were actually changing. We were able to find some of these hidden nodes that were not directly detected as masses, but we predicted were relevant, uh, that were changing. And one of these actually is able to change the viability of these cells. All right, so I'm going to try to wrap up then uh, and try to summarize the basic approach. This omics integrator prize clicking Steiner Force um, uses this very uh, simple approach where we just try to zoom in on a piece of the interactome that we believe is most relevant to disease process. Um, I haven't shown it to you here, but we have other papers where we've shown that it can be done in a patient-specific way. Um, we believe that these are fairly mechanistic models in that they're based on physical interactions, but they're not mechanistic in the way um, that, say, a true keg pathway would be. And so this gets to sort of a general uh, approach that we have, which trying to think about different kinds of modeling approaches based on what kind of scale they work on. Do they work on the genome proteome scale, or do they only work on uh, uh, systems of fairly small known components? and whether they use statistical associations or physical associations. We believe these interactive models live in the upper right-hand corner. They're good at the genome proteome on scale. We can stick in tens of thousands of, uh, uh, of nodes and hundreds of thousands of interactions in principle and get out something interpretable. But they're not uh, predictive in the same way that a differential equation-based model would be predictive or, um, say, you know, a precise uh, model of a, a metabolic uh, process. And so our overall approach that we're trying to work towards is to start with all of our omic data, use these interactive models to shrink down the problem, and then to answer your question, then apply other kinds of modeling techniques where we can more accurately model the dynamics or the logic of the system. Okay. And so uh, with that, I want to close. I want to thank some of my uh, collaborators. I tried to mention everybody in my lab who is working on this uh, as we spoke. Um, but uh, we've had a lot of help with the prize collecting Steiner Force from Ricardo Zakina at the Polytechnico of Turin and Jennifer Chayas and Christian Borgs at the Microsoft Research. And with that, I'd be happy to take your questions. Yes, so we penalize the edges based on their reliability. So the interactive is coming from many different sources. Some of them are from very careful experiments done by somebody who really passionately cared whether protein A interacts with protein B. And others come from, I don't want to make any enemies, but <clears throat> say um, yeast 2 hybrid or something, right? Which is known to have a high false positive uh, rate. And so you want to be able to, to balance those two. You don't want um, yeast 2 hybrid to be considered as significant as something that someone who's been studying for a decade. And so uh, you can think of if you knew a probability that interaction was real, you'd want to um, basically sum up the, uh, the log of the probability, just take the product of all the probabilities in some pathway, right? And so the scores we have are no longer truly probability. When ST was doing it, they actually were probabilities, but it's harder to do that in these mammalian systems. Um, but they're, they try to scale them based on reliability and then um, force the algorithm to use more reliable edges when it can. But how about comparing having an edge with not having an edge? Yeah. So um, the issue is there are a lot of false negatives in the interactome, and that's an unknown, uh, what is the, the um, Rumsfeld kind of known knowns and unknown unknowns. And, yeah. um, so we know there are unknown unknowns, right? So we don't know how many of the, of the edges that are missing are missing because just someone hasn't measured them yet. In this formalism, we have done a little bit of this. You can add predictions. Right, so kind of substrate predictions are easy things to add uh, because we have some good idea of how to do that. In principle, one could add protein-protein interactions from predictions as well, and you'd weight those appropriately to be you know, very low confidence but possible to be there. So um, we need a lot more work as a field on building up the interactive, I think. Yeah. So you had a kind of you based on the degree square from catalytic. Do you have any biological like, knowledge to say that somehow because the other one is a degree and one yeah, so why degree, why are penalties um, linear for degree in proteins and quadratic for metabolites? Ad hoc. 
<laughs> We're just trying to, to make sure that our networks don't connect all by, you know, that calcium isn't connecting everything, that water doesn't connect all biological processes. I mean, water does connect all biological processes, right? But we don't want it to be the short circuit and everything. So when we ran it with a linear degree in, uh, in the metabolites, because the, the um, well, I can't say why the because, but practically when we use a linear uh, penalty for metabolites, we would get um, far too many uh, basically short circuits with uh, very generic molecules that we thought were unlikely to be relevant to any disease process. And one way we can assess that is with randomizations. And so this isn't all just eyeballing it, but we'll take um, input, our real input data, and then we'll do a degree matched um, selection of uh, nodes from the network that um, are simulated data. And we can run that many, many times and see how often we get certain nodes in the random input versus the real input. And if you, when we use the linear degree, uh, linear penalty, we get a lot of these uh, very uh, generic molecules that showed up regardless of what the input was. And when we switched to a quadratic, we got fewer of those. So. <coughs> yeah. Um, have you thought about using like a diffusion random walk based approach instead of the quest selecting style of course and and why did you decide for the the style of course? Yes, the question was have we thought about using a diffusion based approach? So um, we started in this um, because we thought it was a, a framework that we felt we had ideas about how to expand it to incorporate other kinds of data, like the negative data. Um, could one get the same thing with diffusion? I suspect one could. I mean, a good carpenter can build anything with a saw and, and a hammer, right? Um, so I don't know that a bake-off between approaches is necessarily um, uh, all that useful. I think if I were an expert in diffusion-based approaches, I could probably get to the, the same results. Yeah, I guess I can go horizontally. So, so, you know, you talked about the, the positives of having someone sort of passionately interested in measuring a specific protein-protein interaction, but someone might be passionately interested because it's disease-associated. Mm -hmm. And so do you get the same results if you actually use only the unbiased sources, or is it possible that you've got some circularity that's induced? <coughs> Well, that's a really good question. So uh, we haven't tried to systematically remove all the literature-based interactions. Um, that would be an interesting thing to do. I can say we're working across many different diseases, and the approaches seem to work in better studied diseases and less well-studied diseases, but that by itself doesn't answer your question. So that, that might be worth exploring. On the other hand, you're probably removing, <laughs> probably removing a lot of, you know, of good signal, too, right? Um, it's, yeah, that's a, that's a challenge to think about. Yeah. So one thing which, um, I think you touched upon is, for example, the role of water, which interacts with everything. But I think this is a, a, a more general issue. So even in protein-protein interactions or protein-DNA interactions, when we look at those halves, and in particular a very infamous half MIG, now we understand that MIG, at least that, uh, you know, result that seems to be very resonable, that MIG actually is able to uh, modulate any genes. So we have now more and more this example now, water in protein, calcium in proteins, and we can have some uh, ionic effect that really uh, don't fit the network model, but should be some sort of global variables yeah. that, that, that would be incorporated not as part of the network. Would you think about you now extending your approach since you are looking at Right, so the, the question was um, things like water or, uh, or calcium or, or MIC as a transcription regulator really do influence everything. And so could one have a modeling approach that, that deals with that? And maybe that gets to that slide with the different modeling approaches. That The goal of the interactive is to shrink your problem down, identify relevant uh, molecules, um, but it's not the end point, right? We're going to need other kinds of modeling approaches. And so trying to figure out how, say, to put in MIC, so it's regulating all transcripts, I think is something that one could incorporate, but it would be a different modeling approach. Yeah. So uh, in these interactions, you have like, different types of nodes, right? Yes. So the question was, do we have the same kinds of prizes for different kinds of nodes? So the place that we've dealt with this explicitly is the predicted transcription factors, which 
we wrote the algorithm, and so we have very low confidence in it, <laughs> right? So we don't really believe all of our predictions of transcription factors. We don't want them to dominate the network. So we added a variable to sort of tune down the transcription factor prediction, so their prizes. We try to do something that's some uh, log of the probability. We, we try not to have the predicted transcription factors dominate. Um, so the transcription factors are specifically downweighting. In principle, though, one uh, might imagine that one needs to tune other kinds of uh, prizes because the assays um, are not on the same scale. So yeah, that's something we need to explore. Yeah. We rely on other people's solutions. That's the short answer. So uh, there's, uh, it's an NP-hard problem. Uh, there's an exact but obviously very slow solution that's based on integer linear programming that we started with. Um, that didn't scale very well. So uh, Ricardo, uh, Ricardo, whoever he was, um, at the Polytechnico uh, developed a process based on message passing. Um, that's fast enough to solve some of our real problems, but um, uh, we're also talking to some people who've developed some heuristics to try to shrink the part of the network that you need to work on um, before you solve it. So that's not the part that we've done the deep dive in. Uh, we rely on others who are more expert. I think the next person needs to talk, right? Do you have this mic? You do. Yeah, yeah, I do.